spoken reading of a very old book titled The Encyclopedia of Medical Self-Help. Now, before we get started, I should probably let you know that um, this is a very old book, and among that, you should not take anything that's said in this book seriously at all. Um, the reason I chose this book over the many hundreds of other books I own is because this one is absolutely ludicrous. Uh, the advice it offers is not helpful in uh, any way. So, don't listen. Don't pay attention. Just enjoy the, the sound and ridiculousness that is old medical books. We're going to start with Page 5, the abdomen divided into quadrants by imaginary lines. Starting with the letter A. Section A. A medical book for the layman should give all medical advice and information it has to offer in everyday language, unadulterated by Greek and Latin. Doctors themselves have to refer frequently to the medical dictionary for the meaning of antique words. Why, then, display them to the public? This book will talk straight from the shoulder and right over the fence. The reader is therefore asked to please abandon all imaginary notions and superstitions about the structure, functions, and care of the human body. This book will tell you about it in a conformity with the most advanced medical knowledge and in the simplest terms. Advanced medical knowledge, I beg to differ, at this point being 2014, and this book was published in the 70s. Unfortunately, doctors don't know everything as yet about the human body and health and disease. If they knew all they don't know, the information would become too much more than what it is now known. Didn't make sense. As an illustration, consider the discoveries of penicillin and streptomycin, which recently made possible the cure of gonorrhea, syphilis, tuberculosis, meningitis, and many other infectious diseases in a few days or weeks, while it used to take months and years to accomplish half cures. Penicillin and streptomycin have thus in one stroke nullified and made obsolete innumerable drugs, apparatus, and techniques which were used for many years in treating these diseases. All these old treatments are now considered worthless in the face of the one newly discovered fact that the product, product of a certain mold, Penicillium notium, will destroy many kinds of disease-producing germs in the body without harming the body in any way while the old drugs were decidedly injurious. We are badly in need of many more such revolutionary innovations and discoveries in all branches of medication before the knowledge of diseases and their treatments are placed on a rational basis. This will probably not be accomplished unless the U.S. Public Health Service takes over, lock, stock, and barrel the entire practice of medicine, medical research, and drug production. However, a good deal is known about diagnoses and treatment and especially about prevention of disease, and that will be given here in full measure. Let's move on to B. Now, that usually there's actually uh, many more K 
conditions, what you call it, that start with the letter, but that'll take much too long to read through. So we're only going to go from A to B. We're not going to cover anything in between. All right, let's find B. Now, here we go. There's uh, no introduction to B, section B, but there is several different um, things that the book covers. Uh, we'll go over a few. Hopefully, they're not too uh, inappropriate. Oh, here we go. Section B, backache. Backache, low back pain, sacroiliac pain, sacroiliac strain, lumbago, lumboscural strain, lumboscural or sacroiliac relaxation of joint ligaments. All of these were different names used by doctors for what manifests itself to the patient as a most disabling and crippling pain at the end of the spine no matter what the name. Doctors have tests to determine which of the lower back joints is involved. Sometimes all are affected, especially in a rheumatoid arthritis of these joints. An x-ray will show where the trouble is located in case of arthritis, but will disclose no abnormality in most other cases of low back pain. The causes of low back pain are lesion. Almost all of these diseases and abnormalities of abdominal or pelvic organs can produce a backache. Also, after a woman gives birth to one or more children, she will in most cases be left with a chronic backache. High-heeled shoes and flat feet also cause chronic backaches. And so will constipation fatigue from overwork, and general ill health, even sleeping in a too soft bed, is often a cause of backache. It is up to the physician to decide what cause is in any particular case, and advise accordingly. The most usual reason for an aching back is some previous careless action, the sudden strain of heavy lifting or sudden bend or twist of the spine so that the person cannot straighten up. Chronic strain in certain occupations involving bending or stooping may be the cause. In women with chronic, I'm sorry, in women, chronic backache follows too much and too strenuous housework. Exposure to cold, wind, and wetness is a common cause of backache. In all the above cases of the treatment, in all the above, Above cases, there should be a comma there, and no wonder why this was written in the 70s. The treatment consists of one, rest from all work, two, application of heat in some form, and three, a double girdling, tightly drawn binder. Heat may be applied by a baking lamp, hot water bag, or electric pad for 20 to 30 minutes at a time, two or three times a day, or you may ask someone to iron your bag for a few minutes with a fairly hot pressing iron. 
I'm gonna stop right there. Um, okay, that's probably not a good idea. You shouldn't um, iron someone's back with a arrowhead-shaped iron. That'll probably give them a backache, uh, which is exactly what this ridiculous book is trying to help with. Uh, but we'll continue. This often gives prompt relief from acute back pain due to muscular strain or chilling. Support with the double turn binder is better than adhesive strapping. Very few people can tolerate the latter because of soreness and blistering of the skin it often causes. The double binder also has the advantage in that it can be applied and adjusted by the patient himself or herself. This double turn binder is simply a strip of strong unbleached muslin or modernistic linen dish toweling about 10 inches wide and 2 inches long or thereabout, depending on the size of your girth. Apply the center of the linen strip to the center of the abdomen just below the navel. Run it back over the hips on both sides and after crossing the two ends over the small of the back, draw the fist first turn tightly and complete the second turn by bringing the two ends to the front on a halfway lower level than the first turn and covering the hip joints. It's very confusing. Again, draw the ends very tightly together. Pin with three stout safety pins in a row in front. Such a binder would give much comfort and relief to the wearer. Mm, probably not. Women and girls find a double turn binder very useful as a support and a shape molder in healthy states instead of the rubber girdle or corset. Uh, wasn't corsets worn for appearance? I'm not, pfft, okay. <laughs> we'll continue. Let's see where we're. Chronic low back pain often occurs in people who work for long periods in a strained or bent position or whose occupation is sedentary and stooping or requires long hours of standing. In such persons, the normal forward curve, the dorsus, of the lower part of the spine, parentheses lumbar spine, first becomes straight and later even curves backward. Parenthesis kaposis. The treatment of severe cases of low back pain will require at least two weeks of rest in bed, baking, massage, and later diath diathermy. Keeping the upper part of the body supported high on pillows and placing a cushion under the flexed knees will help relax all the muscles and give relief in many cases. During the two weeks in bed, this posture may be assumed for an hour twice a day, or for as long as convenient. Also try lying on the side with the knees flexed and drawn up against the abdomen. Never lie or sleep face down. The double turn binder will be of great help even while in bed and may be worn day and night. When lower back pain follows sudden great strain or very heavy lifting, a displacement parentheses, subluxation of the lumboscral joint may result in this may result and this requires immediate medical attention. A well fitted abdom, abdominal belt is needed in these cases. Parentheses, camp okay <laughs> anatomical supports are scientifically constructed all right let's see let's try to pick one that's not too long so I don't screw up words at the end like I did for that one oh, not that one that's way too long This is a good one. Let's try this one. Section B, baldness. The 
skin of the scalp and the hair, which in structure is just the same as and a continuation of the skin, may very easily be deprived of their free blood supply and hence of their nourishment, thus producing baldness. The scalp is so tightly drawn over and against the bony skull that the slightest constriction, even by hats that are not too tight, will greatly interfere with normal blood supply. It is also apparent that exposure of the head to extreme cold, causing contraction of the skin and the blood vessels, will produce the same effect. The fact that the heart pumps the blood to the scalp against gravity makes the interference with good circulation in the scalp still easier. Tight headgear and exposure to extreme cold deprive the hair of nourishment and cause its falling out. Excessive exposure to sunlight is followed by inflammation and destruction of the hair follicles, in which the microscopic blood capillaries are located, and will, therefore, result in baldness. Shock, fear, and worry make the hair, air quotes, stand on end, or in other words, cause contraction of the little muscles in the skin, thus completely obstructing the blood supply so that grayness and loss of hair result almost overnight. <laughs> okay, so I want to talk about that paragraph for a second. Shock, fear, and worry will make the hair, quote, stand on end. So you get goosebumps, essentially. Your hair stands on its end. And then, um, that apparently obstructs the blood supply, and you'll become either gray-haired or you'll lose all your hair overnight. Mm, no. Acute diseases, by impoverishing the blood and slowing the circulation, will cause great loss of hair. Systemic disease, especially infections, associated with high fever produces baldness, but usually when the patient passes the period of convalescence, improves his diet, and regains his health, there is a new growth of hair. Some cases are caused by local diseases of the scalp, as eczema, seborrhea, ringworm, and other fungus infestations. Certain drugs taken internally as mercury, arsenic, antiprene, antipyrene, and exposure to x-rays can lead to baldness. I've had x-rays before. Didn't go bald. I guess you can consider that to be a balding thing because x-rays are form of radiation. So... Yeah, that could bald you if, you know, it didn't kill you by the time it did. Some cases are caused by... Lo oh, I'm repeating that. Okay, here we go. Due to the... Key oh, I'm screwing up now. <laughs> this book is so confusing. It doesn't really have the best format. Due to the ease of interference with the blood supply and nourishment of the scalp, and the function of its glands, it dries more easily than other parts of the body surface, forming scales, parentheses, dandruff. Hence, dandruff is a natural process, not a disease, so do not be fooled by the scalp treatment fakers and hair tonic vendors. Head and shoulders works pretty well. At least I think it does. 99 out of 100 cases of dandruff need no special treatment but only better hygienic care of the body and scalp. So, dander. Dander is, uh, you need to treat it with better hygienic care. Um, isn't that what head and shoulders is? <laughs> or what, like head massage? Maybe? I don't know. Let's find something else. Okay, section B, 
banana. Banana is a nutritious, nutritious food rich in carbohydrates. Three ounces of the fruit yields 100 calories. It is rich in minerals containing sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, and iron. Its vitamin A content, 100 units per ounce, is equal to that of lettuce and other green vegetables. Bananas also contain vitamins B, C, and G. Ripe bananas are of great value in feeding infants and children suffering from celiac disease, a form of diarrhea. Also, dried banana flakes, Canana brand, can be stirred into lactic acid milk and fed freely to these infants who cannot digest any other starchy food or fat. Oh, here's one on banana sherbet. <laughs> oh, it's a recipe. Section B, banana sherbet. Boil a cup full of sugar in a pint of water to make a syrup. Pour it over the whites of two eggs, stirring briskly. Cool and add one half cup of lemon juice and two cups of orange juice. Freeze this mixture halfway and add a pint of banana pulp or half a pint banana flakes, parentheses, canana brand, and complete the freezing. Uh, sherbet's an ice cream. Where's the milk? That's probably so bad for you. Concentrated lemon juice is terrible. And they want you to boil a cup of sugar. Make a syrup out of it. More like making candy. Let's find something. Here we go. Section B, beds. Beds should be provided with mattresses minus inner springs. Such mattresses are less likely to throw your muscles and joints out of gear than the soft and sagging ones. In cold weather and in cold quarters, it is better to go to sleep between blankets than between cold sheets. Okay. Here we go. Section B. Beef tea. That would be beef as in B-E-E-F and tea as in T-E-A, like the drink. Cut up a pound of lean meat, parentheses, round steak, into fine pieces. Place it in a pint of cold water and let it stand for two hours. Then let it simmer, not boil for two hours on a low fire, adding water to make up a pint as it evaporates. Squeeze out all the meat to get the juice into the liquid portion. Strain away the pieces, salt to taste. Keep in refrigerator, if not used at once. It's not refrigerator, it says frigidaire. I said refrigerator. <laughs> it seems like a proper word. I don't know what a refrigerator is. Alright, let's find something. No, not that. Ah, section B. Birds. Keeping birds in the home is unsanitary and unhygienic. They are a source of virus infection called psittacosis and also of various parasitic and bacterial infections. Well, if they're not clean, yeah. Well, this is going to be an interesting one. Section B, biters. Biters are medicines taken to stimulate the appetite. 
Never take biters that contain powerful drugs like strychnine, quinine, or others. This prescription would make an effective and harmless biter tonic. Dude, you can get a prescription out of a book? Must have been real old. I love how they said never take biters that contain strychnine <laughs> because it'll, you know, kill you. It's a poison. And again, quoting this book, it seems like poisons were the medicine back then. Right, here we go. Here's a prescription. Tincture gentian compound, 4 drams. Tincture calumba, 6 drams. Tincture capsicum, 10, dr 10 drops. Elixir pepsin, NF, enough to make 4 ounces. Mix. Take a teaspoon three days, uh, three times a day before meals. Apparently, it says to stimulate the appetite. Well, if you take it before the meal, what good is that going to do? You're already going to be eaten by the time it kicks in. Just appetite's the need for food, not right before it. Oh, I know why it's an appetite stimulant. It's probably going to taste horrible and make you want to eat the slice of pizza that's in front of you. That makes sense. Now I know why that works. It stimulates your appetite by pissing you off. Alright, let's get into the C. Section C. B is pretty much exhausted. Still tons of stuff, but... Nothing interesting. There we go. Oh, this would be a good one to read. Section C. Caffeine. Caffeine is a very powerful drug. Parentheses, alkaloid. Acting as a stimulant to the nervous system, the heart, the lungs, and the kidneys. Most of its effects on the body are produced through its action on the nervous system, but its harmful effect on the heart results directly from its poisonous effect on the heart muscle. I didn't know it'll poison you. <laughs> Small doses stimulate and alert the nervous system to activity and increase heart action, but larger doses take often cause, oh, sorry, but larger doses taken often cause a rapid heartbeat to remain permanently, and later there are irregularities and in jumping contractions indicating fibrillation, which means permanent heart damage. Caffeine injures the heart muscle even more than digit Talis, digitalis, and by causing contraction of the blood vessels, it makes the blood pressure rise. Large doses taken often have an even more dangerous effect, causing pain and fullness in the head, restlessness, confusion, insomnia, ringing in the ears, disturbance of vision, tremors, and hallucinations. The caffeine in coffee, the thionine in tea, the alkaloids (parentheses theobromine) and chocolate and cocoa, all are of the same nature, have the same effect on the heart and nervous system, and should only be used as drugs in emergencies. <laughs> oh my God, are you okay? Here, have a coffee and a chocolate bar. That'll make you feel better. It does, though. It makes me feel better in the morning. But, I don't know. If someone's, like, croaking, I wouldn't give them a chocolate bar. Coffee has a volatile oil in it, in which, when taken in small amounts, acts as a stimulant to the appetite and as a laxative. See, that's very true. But taking coffee too often leads to indigestion, heartburn, and hyperacidity. Tea produces chronic constipation and indigestion because of the tannin, parentheses, tannic acid, 
it contains so that the scant benefit certainly doesn't repay for the irreparable damage perpetrated by these drinks. Tea, coffee, and the soft drinks, parentheses, cola. That's pretty specific there. Why not Pepsi? Sprite? Dr. Pepper? Relying on similar drugs seem to pep you up, but they are not ultimately conductive to good health and should not be imbibed indiscriminately or frequently, if at all. So, don't drink tea or coffee or don't need any chocolate bars unless, of course, it's an emergency and you're about to die. Let's pick one. Whoa, that's way too long. Section C, canines. Canines are the four pointed teeth, upper and lower, situated between the incisors and biscopides on each side. They were also called the eye teeth because they were in line with the center of the eyeball. The canine is the third tooth from the midline. I didn't know it's in the center of your eyeball. How would you even measure that? Poke a stick through someone or something? Ooh, this is a good one. I'm a, I'm a fan to go way off topic, but then go back on topic. I'm actually a fan of spicy food. I like to eat very spicy food. So this next section is going to be interesting for spicy food lovers. Section C. Capsicum dash pepper. Capsicum or pepper is used in medicine as a stimulant to the appetite. It is also useful in stopping fermentation and preventing gas distension of the intestines by the following prescription. So here's the uh, prescription here. Tincture columba 4 drams. Tincture capsicum 1 dram. Elixir lactated pepsin enough to make four ounces. Mix. Take a teaspoon three times a day before meals in water. The tincture of pepper is also useful as a hair tonic, stimulating the circulation of the scalp through the following prescription. <laughs> what, you can sprinkle pepper in my hair? Call me Rihanna or Lady Gaga or something. Okay. Here's a prescription. Tincture cantharides, 2 drams. Tincture capsicum, 4 drams. Castor oil, 1 dram. Isopropyl alcohol. Other people might know that crazy name as rubbing alcohol. <laughs> enough to make six ounces mix in label for external use yeah you wouldn't want to drink that pour on a small piece of absorbent cotton and wet the whole scalp with it then massage gently for a few minutes use it two to three times a week if the scalp becomes too sensitive stop for a week then use it again if no irritation is caused, you may use it more often. Be sure not to touch the eyes with this preparation, and wash your hands well after using it. Pepper, cantharides, and alcohol are unfriendly to the eyes. I love how it's different for the scalp. <laughs> yeah, alcohol is sensitive to the eyes, but you wouldn't want to pour rubbing alcohol over yourself. I just go buy hair tonic from like Walmart or something.
here we go. Section C, cat bites. <laughs> this is going to be good. Cat bites are often deeply penetrating wounds and a strong antiseptic should be thoroughly applied. Inserting the swab dipped in antiseptic into every puncture as far as it will go, using a fresh swab for every puncture. Okay, I kind of saw that in my head when I was reading. That sounds way more painful than the cat bite itself. Sticking a cotton swab into the bite? Ow! Tincture of iodine, metaphen, myrithiolate are all effective. When using these tinctures, it is best to wait a few minutes to permit the tincture to evaporate before covering the wound with a sterile gauze or a reaction or burn may be caused by the strong alcoholic antiseptic. Dude, you gotta put it... <laughs> I love this book. Oh, you got a cat bite that's deeply penetrating? Put a strong alcohol into the cat bite. Oh, but... Don't forget to shove it into your bone with the, uh, what's it called, swab. And make sure, <laughs> make sure you let it evaporate. You'll burn yourself. Don't worry about putting that burning alcohol in, onto your skin. You gotta use it for the wound, it's the most important part. It is advisable to let the wound bleed freely before applying the antiseptic. But do not press it. Just wipe away the blood with gauze and apply the antiseptic. Cats may be infected with rabies. And a doctor should be called to decide what other measures are to be taken. Alright, we're going to leave off there. So let me mark the page. Uh, if you'd like to hear more ludicrous treatments and ailments from the very old Encyclopedia of Medical Self-Help, uh, feel free to leave a comment. Uh, I'm going to have a link to my Google Plus page in all of my descriptions on my videos now. So if you'd like, you can post there and uh, give me some ideas there. Pretty much anything you can think of, I'd be able to uh, read from that book. It's quite big and heavy. So, uh, thank you for tuning in to that sarcastically hysterical reading. And I'll see you either in the comments or the next episode of the Encyclopedia of Medical Self-Help.